Welcome to the afternoon session of our third day of our machine learning in medicine summer school. It's my great pleasure to introduce the first keynote speaker of the afternoon, Joachim Schulze from the German Center for Neurodegenerative Diseases, DZNE, and the University of Bonn. Uh, Joachim Schulze is by education a doctor of medicine, uh, studied at Tübingen, and then had a career station in, in Freiburg and at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in, in uh, Boston, in Massachusetts, and, and uh, then moving to the University of Cologne as a professor of tumor immunology, and then joining Bonn University and that DZNE afterwards, where he has now leading roles. He is the director uh, for systems medicine at DZNE. He's also the coordinator of the German COVID omics initiative. He has won a number of important awards like the Sofia Kowalewskaya Award of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. He's a highly cited researcher um, in the Web of Science group. Um, and uh, he's the founding director of the platform for single cell genomics and epigenomics at the University of Bonn and at the German Center for Neurodegenerative Diseases. Uh, he has published uh, a paper this year about swarm learning in clinical AI, which not only made it into nature, but even onto the cover page of, of nature and, and created a big echo in the community. Uh, we are very happy to have him here today and uh, to, to learn more about your work, Joachim, and about the exciting opportunities for decentralized learning in clinical AI. Welcome and the floor is yours. Thanks for, for having me. Um, and, uh, you know, from the introduction, you realize that I'm not a machine learning guy by, by training, um, but I'm a, a MD with an interest in mathematics for a long time and in computation and bioinformatics. And um, the things that we're doing since a couple of years is very clear that if we, if we discover and, and want to use new data spaces in medicine that we cannot even see with our you know, see, smell, um, touch uh, with the senses like genomics data, that's very clear that we need machine learning. And that's why we're investing into this. So uh, you also see that what I show you today is the joint venture um, between Hewlett Packard and the DZNEs. We were working on that together. So some of the slides, uh, my colleagues were so nice to share them with me. Um, and I have some from the DZNE and we use them all together. So um, I think that's also something that I don't have to tell this audience um, that in, in contrast to the, the way where you basically have a top-down uh, situation where you have uh, a model and with rules and then you make predictions, um, usually not with uh, a lot of data, you then basically use data later on to see whether, um, whether you, the model is uh, predicting the data. Um, we, we see more and more in medicine and that this is actually the opposite. Yeah? We just um, have a lot of data that we cannot even grasp the patterns. Yeah? Think about this. How can I, as a, as a human being, um, look at genomic data without uh, basically looking at the patterns by algorithms? There's no way. Yeah? If you take an x-ray, you can see still use your eyes, uh, some of us at least, um, if you have uh, genomic data, that's out of question. And so I think in, in medicine, particularly, you have more and more the, uh, the opposite. Um, you generate a lot of data, um, and then you have to find the patterns. Um, and then later on, you basically use these patterns to predict new samples. So this is, this is our basic concept. Of course, what that means is you need a lot of data. Um, and uh, that's already one of the bigger bottlenecks in, in medicine because uh, medicine is, uh, is fractured in many small entities. Uh, as you start with uh, private practitioners having data up to large centers, um, but there's not so much connection, at least in the areas where I basically work in. Um, we all know that the, the way it starts with machine learning is of course that you are having an institute um, and you have your infrastructure, you have your ideas and uh, you basically think about locally, how could you basically use machine learning, for example, to predict a diagnosis of a patient. And um, 
whenever you have been there for a long time, you also know that not a single place on this earth has enough data really um, that we're satisfied with what we would like to see with, uh, with uh, machine learning. If you compare the medical data space that we have with some of the public data space, it's just too small. So very often what happens is that there's a huge bias. We locally measure and analyze it. Um, but if you then try to generalize it, you take one model from one center and apply it to the others. Usually this is not very well uh, behaving. And it's very clear because you're also training in your data, the bias of the location. And I can tell you that this is even true for Im a lot of imaging data in, in because although we should have the same machines and should have the same settings and so on, um, there is differences in the genomics field where I'm more familiar with. We know exactly what the bias of the different genome centers are. Um, so single, single center studies um, have a huge bias. So um, of course, um, over the last, I would say 10 to 15 years, the solution to that was very simple. Um, if you need more data, we should just take everybody's data, push them somewhere centrally. Um, and then do everything there because then you have all the issues that I just talked about are somewhat gone now. Yeah? And this is true if you then look at also at the um, at the um, <clears throat> performance. Usually, what you have is that uh, the central models really um, have a much higher accuracy, and um, mainly this is due because you have just much more data and the, the bias from the different places are, um, are reduced. Um, and of course, you can also take care of that if you have um, access to the whole data. Now, for some areas that might be fine, um, for medicine, this is, a, this is an issue because of uh, many, many uh, points. I just give you three major ones that I see is one is cost because um, um, data transfer and data storage, particular data application in, in data spaces that are large is not a very good and sustainable idea. Um, then there is data security um, issues because there are rules in the medical field that makes these kind of settings really much more difficult. And since the GDPR has been um, um, updated a couple of years ago, this is even more complicated. So um, <clears throat> although it has good accuracy and demonstrates uh, um, gen generic models, uh, we have these disadvantages. Now, um, summarizing that, for us, um, we have looked at that, uh, particularly in genomic data, but also in imaging data, for example, here at the DZNE, we have 10 sites. And for example, at the moment, if we want to transfer NMR data from one site to the next, we're basically loading them to a, a hard drive and put them into a FedEx and then send them over. And this is uh, not really cost effective long term. As I told you, um, more and more, if you carefully read what the GDPR allows and what it doesn't allow, it's getting very complicated to put things uh, centrally. Um, when we go across enterprises or across organizations, it get, gets really complicated because then our legal and financial issues that have to be taken care of in a completely new way. Um, in science, we often have not dealt with that, but our institutions are getting more and more aware of that. So that's also an issue. And then, of course, in, in out, outside of science, if you think about uh, companies that would like to work together, it's also hard to just give away your data because uh, all the data is, is value these days. So um, the, the idea, of course, to, to address that has been put out a couple of years ago, and that uh, the term out there and is a huge field is of course federated learning. Um, and we have looked into that and we also know that there is uh, federated learning peer to peer um, basically. Um, but if you look at those models and those systems that could be applied to the medical domain, there's one thing that still bothers us quite a bit uh, and that's the uh, central custodian. So in, in other words, while the data now stay at the edge, and the models are trained at the edge, um, so you don't don't uh, share the large data anymore, um, which also deals to some extent with data privacy. The problem in most of the systems is still that there is somebody or some institutions that centrally coordinates that all. And in the domain of medicine, that's our experience. This is still not such a good idea, particularly if you think about um, across the world. Um, if you have central players that 
by definition means that there is uh, there is the the chance of monopoly at least for parameter space in this case inside space if it's not data itself so for us the idea would have been you know yes that's a very good step forward um, and it uh, deals with quite some issues but it doesn't deal with all of them yeah so um, it solves some of the privacy issues although not completely because uh, if the parameter space is not well controlled you could still uh, basically have attempts to um, to reconstruct the data by the parameters um, and for us, the most problematic point was the uh, central custodian in those systems that uh, were available at that time. And that's why when we came together last year, um, it's an interesting point. You have a crisis like a pandemic. Uh, I think that's a time for innovation. Um, we came from two sites at the DZNE. We had basically pushed out a catalog um, before the pandemic. What do we actually want to do? to have uh, across sites, uh, basically have the people to, to learn together. Um, and um, how could we basically organize that? And we had basically made bullet points what we really would like to do. At the same time, there was a team led by Englim Go at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. They looked at it from a technical point of view with a very different motivation. The major motivation was that um, transferring data and duplicating data in central models is not sustainable. Um, just cost wise and therefore they said like we have to keep the data somewhere but then we have the problem if we want to use data across enterprises or across organizations then all the legal stuff starts so we have to make sure that this is not happening beyond what has been done in federated and so um, we came up um, with uh, with this term swarm learning and then in, in, in principle um, there is no central custodian so there's not one ruling this everybody is equal and like uh, and like minded. Uh, there's, a, there's a partnership. Um, the network reflects that, also the technical solution. Um, and that's very important to us. Yeah? So you basically, before you start doing anything, you make the rules how the network should work and how every new member should basically get onto this. Um, the ownership of the data remains local. Of course, if the network would discuss and think different than they could but that's the default so you really have um, this and you can also put that into a um, into a contract into a intelligent uh, contract <clears throat> that is part of the blockchain that's part of the swarm learning principle we also solve the data protection and security um, locally and also make very much uh, sure that um, the attempts that you can basically extract from the parameters, um, again, data, um, reduce that even further. Um, and then, um, then um, what we have already shown and seen is that um, since we basically, the way we basically integrate the uh, learning um, it results um, is reducing the bias from that comes from each of the sites dramatically. And I can allude to that later on again. So how does this actually, uh, this process uh, flows? How does this work? So let's pr pretend or let's presume that there is a group of institutions that decided to build such a swarm network. They have their data and they have their processing power. By the way, they can be completely different. It's very much scalable. So you can have uh, swarms with very different uh, sites concerning the power of uh, HPC or not even HPC. Um, and as well as data. Um, um, so that's that's another very big advantage. The Swarm can actually take care of that. Uh, the first thing is that everybody registers. So once you have the, 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 um, the electronic contract that decides all the rules concerning the data, the data quality, the algorithms, um, the responsibilities, the rules, the rights, and so on. Then a node can register. And of course, before that, and I come back to that, there's some technical installations, but let's presume this has been done. Um, the node registers to the Swarm network and receives the um, model um, that was decided to be used. Um, then all the sites train the model um, locally uh, for a certain time window. We call this the epoch. And then, of course, once this is done, um, one of the players within the swarm has been randomly selected to collect all of them. Another, another option is that the, the one node that is the first in this round would be the one that collects all the results from the other one. So in this case, would be the lower left here. 
Um, and then this uh, node shares the merge of the trained models and the merge again has rules and these rules can be uh, de de decided by the swarm beforehand. For example, you could take the parameters and have the mean or the median or the averaged. Uh, this, is, uh, this is something that uh, the, the swarm decides beforehand. Once you have this optimized uh, parameter set, then you basically repeat the whole thing. And then you do that as long as uh, the swarm decides to test a certain uh, result. And of course, uh, machine learning principles um, that you have to divide training and testing and so on is all implemented automatically. So this is, this is not an issue anymore. So um, what you basically have as a difference then is that the data and the parameters are at the edge. Um, you basically, collect them only to make the best model out of all of them. And this is not basically put by one single entity, but the swarm basically has a principle how this is dealt with. Um, this is some pre-pilots from the, um, from the, uh, from Hewlett Packard in-house with some in-house data and what they could show in their in-house uh, setting that the swarm basically behaved uh, like a central model more or less. Yeah. And of course that's what made them interesting. So like, okay, what about if you go into real real uh, world scenarios? And, and this is why we then joined and, and worked together on this. And I come back to that. Before I do this, yeah, just to mention a couple of things again, you know, it has high accuracy. Uh, we have actually situations where we um, have been better than the central model. And we also know why uh, we can discuss that later. Um, and um, the system itself, the technical solution is really uh, very strong in enhancing privacy and also security. So this is our idea. Yeah, so we're coming from uh, local learning. Central learning has a, a lot of advantages, not so much for medicine. Federated is the way forward from central. This is that there we are for sure. Um, um, but we think, you know, once you have the blockchain technology combined with the swarm uh, as part of the swarm learning, and uh, you have also the um, the complete uh, edge parameter and data setting, then this is the this is the, the next step basically. And um, what's be beyond that is um, is very important is is this privacy preserving or private or permission blockchain network. It has nothing to do with with blockchain that. <laughs> In the, in the public domain is very often connected with Bitcoin or others of these uh, crypto um, um, currencies. Um, the blockchain principle, yes, but um, it's based on a smart contract and a ledger. So um, that makes this very versatile and also very fast. Yeah. And the other thing is that um, for the moment being, we're seeing that as uh, swarms that have a, as a size, a size that is um, certainly uh, in the in the dozens to hundreds, um, what we are not pursuing because we're more interested in the medical domain from institutions um, is that uh, we don't see that for the end user market at the moment. But that's something um, you might have to ask them to the Packard Enterprise whether they're going in this direction as well. The whole thing is dynamic. You can onboard new nodes if they accept the smart contract and the ledger. Um, it cannot. Um, you cannot access the whole thing if you don't. If you're not. Un, if you're not authorized, and that's uh, very nicely protected. And this is already nicely productified. Um, we don't have the central custodian, um, and we also um, saw that. And this has been tested also by our partners, and this is continuing to be done. Of course. Um, that um, it prevents insider attack from semi-honest or dishonest uh, participants because uh, this uh, blockchain is taking care of that in a, in a very sophisticated way. Um, so um, to show you uh, an example that we also used real-world uh, uh, data is um, we were also asked, you know, how's the performance changing um, when you um, onboard new additional nodes? And so um, here we basically took um, a situation where we had uh, three nodes where um, we by, uh, by purpose basically had not so high accuracy data at these nodes. And you can see that it really took a while uh, when we uh, trained this swarm that there was a, was a decent result. This is the accuracy of, of a machine learning test uh, diagnosing leukemia. And you could see basically that we reached something around 82% or so. 
Um, again, you know, a simulation basically saying like we knew that uh, these nodes did not have the best data at hand. At the other time, we, we basically use data from hematology departments where the data is extremely um, good. Um, and you could see that it takes a couple of epochs, but then they're stabilizing uh, after 40 epochs, and then you have very high accuracy. And what happens actually if you do this um, in, in a different, you have six nodes, you start basically with the three low prevalence nodes, and then you basically take the three additional nodes that we had tested beforehand. Later on, you just uh, let them start with epoch 35. And then you can basically see that you very quickly reach again the same result as if you would not have had the other ones. It's actually in the end even better. Yeah, and um, this uh, scale doesn't tell you, but you know it's very important for such tests, diagnostic tests, this, that you're very having a very high accuracy, sensitivity, and specificity. And it, although these three nodes do not provide the best data, just because we now are able to provide more data, yeah, the results, the overall results after these 80 epochs uh, is becoming much better than um, without these nodes. So you can actually have a continuous training. That's something we're envisioning for the future. Right now, this is not possible in medicine because if you have a diagnostic test, whether it's on a test tube uh, and a metric measurement or whether it might be an AI algorithm that leads to a probability, um, you have to basically freeze the, the system and then uh, apply with the regulatory or authorities, and then you can use that test as it is. Um, but honestly, you know, what we show here already, and, and, and I'm pretty sure we can show that in many other um, examples, is that um, continuous learning would be much better because then you can improve and take every new, new case that you discovered beforehand and even further improve the results. Um, short word about um, um, data security and privacy. Um, so, of course, um, this is an area which has, I'm also convinced, has to be looked at continuously, also for swarm learning, but also for federated or, 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 or central or local. Most of the things are actually similarly important. It doesn't matter really what your structure is. Um, and of course, um, these, the, the security aspects for data sets is ownership and governance. The attack vectors could be easily theft or re-identification, reconstruction or tracing. And then there's a couple of prevention mechanisms like anonymization, pseudo-anonymization, encryption, different privacy. And this is nothing that is specific for Swarm. This is true for federated. This is true for, for um, central as well as local learning. Same for algorithms and models. Again, we, we see that complementary to the setup, um, you have the security aspects are the owners or the algorithms themselves. And then the same thing again, theft is an issue, model inversion, adversarial manipulation. And then here again, things like homomorphic encryption or secure multi-party computation are potential mechanisms to prevent that. And here um, we're working uh, with uh, several partners in the meantime. Uh, one of them is CISPA in Saarbrücken, where we also try to basically adapt or even improve for certain questions, um, the security and privacy aspects. Um, this really depends on the domain. So in, in, in medicine, this might be more important. In climate research, this might be less important, but that's uh, something to be uh, seen once this evolves. Now, um, when you look more from the, from the technology, what is basically um, necessary, you have to have a certain HP uh, um, compute infrastructure. Um, we, we, by purpose, and, and HP is doing the same, we call that just the infrastructure layer. It can be scalable. So you could have something like an HPC, but you could also have a large workstation to start with this. And for some model building, even a very, very good laptop can, can do this um, just to see whether there is something in. Of course, this um, um, we uh, think that can be all on premise, but you could even take swarms of clouds. So yeah, clouds of clouds, if you wish so, um, because honestly, we don't think that there will be uh, a mega cloud in the future. Even if there is cloud data, you could think about on top of that, a swarm that connects different cloud data. And then you have on the one side, you have your um, machine learning platform, um, you know, standard could be used here the Ethereum blockchain, and this is basically um, all settled by the Swarm Learning Library, which has been developed by HPE. And then on top, you have basically have the data and the uh, machine learning uh, models. 
this all is containerized um, to make it easy to be installed. So you need basically a virtualization infrastructure. And then on top of that, um, it's basically a containerized system that can be installed. Uh, also, the API is um, supposed to be simple so that um, machine learning models can be easily integrated. <clears throat> and um, the hyperparameters are tunable, although we did not really use that yet, um, but there is more in than we showed so far. Um, and then you have basically the management commands to control the whole network. Now, and again, as I said, there's not one central unit that does that. It's basically from learning process to learning process is a different member of the small. Um, you can also look at that from a deployment view. So you have five components and, or containers. One is the swarm learning, uh, basically for running the user-defined machine learning algorithms. One is the blockchain. Then there is a Spire server, security identity integration. There's a license server. And then there is a SWCI command interface uh, so that uh, people can actually interact with the swarm itself. So this would basically look like this. There would be an organization. And again, it's all containerized. Yeah? Um, so it's pretty simple. The licenses uh, for the node, SWCI node, the swarm learning node with the, with the model, the Spire server. Then you connect basically the next organization, the next organization, the third one, they're all having the same setup. And then you start basically to connecting that. And then once they're all connected, they have seen each other, the, the blockchain says, yes, everybody who was allowed to get in there is in, then you can basically start um, doing the learning process. That's how it works. Yeah, and um, from the, if you look at um, the, um, the code, um, the idea is there also that to make it very simple. So to call basically the swarm, there's not so much difference uh, to be done. Um, and this is also in the nature paper, which we published. So this can be easily looked at. Um, also the tools um, are, can, be, can be tested freely. And of course, um, from our experience, we're also happy to share what, uh, what we learned with the system. So, um, and since it's containerized, as I said, it's really something if, if you have set up your system, and I think most of the modern cutting edge or state of the art systems should be virtualized with uh, container systems to be loaded, then this is not something uh, uh, rocket science anymore. Now I would shift gears and give you um, some insights and auto to the use cases, um, because I think that makes, makes the, the, the big difference. Um, we saw, of course, a lot of people that had maybe similar ideas, but just ideas. Um, and of course, uh, we have also a lot of new ideas actually, but we always have to show first, do the ideas actually work? Um, so, um, of course, that's our domain, and uh, we could convince also our partners uh, from Hewlett Packard and from the computation science departments uh, which uh, um, use cases we should choose. Um, it's very clear medicine is an interesting one because it has all these problems with data sharing. Um, that's actually inherent to, to medicine. Um, just think about this. Um, if you are a, a, a patient, um, what you don't like to see is that your data is completely freely available everywhere. That's why you have a physician that you can trust that do you know that physician cannot even share the information about your health with the physician next door, because that's not within the physician patient uh, contract. Yeah. So if if you if your physician wants to share information or wants to ask another physician for opinion, he has to first ask you, and this is since hundreds of years like that. Yeah? Even if you go to a hospital and there's more doctors, you actually might not have seen that, but you signed basically that doctors can talk to each other about you. Uh, and if you don't sign, then they actually have to deal with you completely different. Yeah? But this is a privilege in, in medicine. And what happened basically so far with central models and so on is basically neglecting what is there for hundreds of years and how it worked for hundreds of years. What I think what swarm learning does is basically it does not neglect it, it just uses it yeah? because it does two things. It protects the privacy. At the same time, we learn together and that's what doctors also do. Yeah? They're learning about insights, but not about data. Yeah? So if I say like I have a case um, and I have this, this findings based on these parameters, you never talk about who is that. 
but you're basically saying I have now an idea what this 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 disease is, and this is only based on the parameters basically that define these uh, diseases and not on the data itself that are gathered by the patient. So um, that's the, basically the, the, the major issues. And then of course, it comes other things that are interesting, for example, demographic biases. So if you take a hospital in Europe and one in Asia and one in Africa and one in South America and in North America, then we have biases because that's normal. People live in different circumstances. They have different genetic backgrounds. So um, if we even looking at the same disease, then we will have differences in the patterns that we're looking at. Um, and so these kind of things are also much more easily seen if you um, use um, a swarm so that you can really see which of the parameters are completely independent of the location where you are. So these challenges exist and um, the print, as I said, the pre mentoring principles have existed since ancient times. So, you know, doctors learn from each other, but they're not learning about their patients. They're learning about their insights and the diseases. And that's basically the parameter space and the data, if you want so. So what could you use? Um, of course, X-rays. Um, there is uh, CT scans and MR images. So everything that has images and of course, we all know about uh, the large uh, public data sets from Google and others where you can look for patterns. Um, you know, a medical um, device pushing out images is nothing else. Um, we could use clinical data yeah, from the history of the patient, also from physical exams, uh, clinical laboratory parameters, and so on. Um, what's interesting for the future is certainly the continuous data like EKGs, uh, wearables, and so on. Um, what we know already where machine learning works pretty nicely is by in, in uh, hygiene optimization. So really seeing what is the best to, to be done in an operation room or in an intensive care unit. Then there's a huge and completely new field, which is omics data. Um, and it comes from the genome, the transcriptome, proteome, and so on. And that's why it's so important because, you know, all the other things up there, x-rays, CT scans, and so on, particularly clinical data, doctors can use their senses and basically make sense out of the patterns that they see by a patient. Yeah? You, you ask a couple of questions, you do a couple of exams, uh, you do tests and so on, and then you take that pattern and it's like, well, that's a leukemia. If you now use data spaces where we can have no sense to look at, uh, and that's basically, and, and we're trying hard to make sense, to, to translate basically the information of such data into something that we can see. Um, we're losing usually a lot of information. Then these are spaces where we really could apply machine learning and really accelerate medicine in the future. Oops, that is the wrong. <clears throat> so, um, I'm not sure whether a lot of you have done biology before. Just a short recap. You have everybody of us has a genome. Um, these are all the genes that are in, in your genome is the, is the genome. Um, the technology and the science that looks at this is called genomics. Then we have, of course, um, every cell has to somehow read the genome. The first thing that is happening is as a transcription. And that's why we then call all the all the molecules that are transcribed from the genome are the transcripts and the and the technology is transcriptomics. Um, this is not yet uh, done, and there's a next step which then makes proteins in the cell, and every cell has different kinds of proteins, and that's called translation. And uh, we have a lot of experience in transcriptomics, and that's a space that gives you a lot of information, a lot of parameters. Um, there's uh, there's an un undiscovered area um, where we can learn a lot from for pattern recognition and then in diagnostics actually looking at different diseases. While transcriptome data um, in contrast to many other medical data is highly standardized from the beginning. Um, it is high resolution. So we have a lot of parameters uh, in, in the data space. Um, it reflects the activity of cells, uh, tissues, and organs. So this is when a, a disease is uh, changing something, we will see changes in the transcriptome. So that gives us a, a, a possibility to understand differences and therefore then disease-specific patterns. Um, and then we can uh, extract these very easily. So there are... Um, you know, we know how this transcriptome works, so we can also see how the parameter space should work. 
Um, it is more and more used, so the data become more and more available. Even people think are now about medical diagnostics. Um, and so with that, we are basically having a data space that uh, for the future might hold up a lot of in information about um, um, diseases where we have not yet used it really. Now in cancer, for example, it's very widely used already, but uh, in other diseases, there is a high steep increase of generating of these data. What we have done is basically we generated uh, data sets, uh, compiled them with a lot of metadata from around the world. Um, these are from many different studies. Um, these, the first uh, we had already done before the look, uh, before the uh, crisis, before we started to work together with uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise. This was about leukemia, and it took several PhD students, amongst them Steffi Warner Terrestal, but already beforehand to collect them um, and then to ask also the people that basically generated these data back and back to get really good metadata. So I think. We have a, a rather nice uh, data set now, highly uh, curated um, metadata, are extremely good, and the parameter space is also very good. Um, there are three of them. Uh, the biggest one is the second one, which is called dataset A2 with about uh, eight and a half thousand uh, transcriptomes. Um, and the reason why there are three is because they have been prepared with three different technologies in the laboratory. And there you can already see that um, you know, over time, these technologies change, and then you cannot just include them. Um, what we then basically did is um, asked a, a simple question, um, because we knew that this can, in, in theory, be answered if you take a central model. That's what we had published before, and um, had cases and controls. So either you were leukemia or you were um, healthy or had a different disease. And then we basically split the data in different nodes along these, for example, studies that had been done, um, but also other, uh, other ways of splitting them. Uh, so we, we also wanted to uh, see what, what influences the analysis. So we also um, um, did different scenarios. Every node then had their own uh, data that was seed siloed. They were never exchanged afterwards. You know, so we pretended that each of them would have been from one single uh, hospital. But the swarm basically could uh, take the three local learnings and integrate them. And then we basically had completely independent data on a test node that could have been a fourth hospital or another institution in another country where whatever we had learned from the uh, local ones or from the swarm would then be tested independently. And so um, we had a couple of scenarios. So here is one where you can clearly see that there is one node which had 8% of all samples in this uh, scenario. Um, that had uh, similar numbers of controls and cases, but we also did some where it's really bad because you almost have no cases and that's a, not a very good training situation. And then vice versa, more, more cases and controls. And you can clearly see that, um, you know, let's take this one first. If you take local training with almost no um, cases, you can see that the, the, the algorithm that comes out is very poor. Yeah? So if you then test on a, an independent data set, which is here, the accuracy shown, you have basically you know, more, more or less gambling, which we would have expected. But what's interesting is even if we have these ones in here, the swarm basically um, actually uses this information still and behaves much better. Yeah. So the swarm, of course, takes all that into account, measures the parameters, and then over the epochs comes up with better accuracy than these single nodes together. What was also interesting to us is an even distribution here was much better than if you didn't have an even distribution. Another setting was uh, was shown here. Yeah. So here, what we did is basically we had different clinical studies from different um, different countries, even, and we pushed basically said like you know there's country one, country two, country three, with all their biases in how they did the studies and so on, and see whether the swarm would improve each of the individual um, studies here. And this is also the case, you can see that uh, if you then test again on an independent node that um, the integration of the parameters by the swarm um, basically resulted always in better test accuracy, but also sensitivity, specificity, and so on. Yeah. And um, this is one of these signs that um, there, of course, there is um, bias in each of these sites. But if you then integrate this, the bias is basically getting reduced, and that's why you get better results over, over time. 
This is uh, shown here also for the technologies. So without going into much detail, what we also could show is that um, the data set that we compiled, the A1, was done on an old way of measuring the transcriptome that was done with a device which we called a microarray. Um, of course, there were different types. So the second data set was microarray 2. Um, and then the third data set was basically already with a mo modern way of uh, transcriptome uh, generation. This is by RNA sequencing. So this is another, it's a completely different technology. In the end, you get also some values. Um, that can, are comparable, but they're not identical. Yeah? So if you measure something with array one and take the same sample and do RNA-seq, you will see differences. Yeah? And what was really amazing is that if you take then these examples, you can clearly see that when you train only on RNA-seq data and then later have a data set that has samples from, from all three technologies, you see that this node doesn't really behave very well. Um, while the swarm can actually deal with that and then even um, push out uh, better results. So this also makes us very um, optimistic because that's the situation that we have and will have in the future. You know, when you measure things in the clinics, there might be new machines or new devices that brings better data. But then the question is, can do we have to toss everything that is out there already? And the answer here is no, as, lo as long as we can integrate them in a way that we can take out the bias of the technology or the, or the, or the version of the technology, then, um, then and, and Swarm does that actually, then we can actually even use uh, historical data um, to bring better results in the end. The second use case, and um, this is the second last, and then we can start discussion. I show you also a little bit about COVID. Um, was tuberculosis because you know it's still one of the top uh, causes of death in the world, um, particularly outside of a pandemic. Um, 1.4 million uh, died in 2019, so before the pandemic, from TB. Uh, this is something in Western countries we don't know about so much, but this is really happening. Plus, TB. Um, a lot of people are ill with TB. Um, TB, if it's not multi-resistant, is curable and preventable. Um, and the, um, the, the point, of course, is that there are certain countries in the world that have the highest burden. What is worrisome for us here in the Western world is um, that there's more and more multi-drug resistant TB coming back. So in the old days in Europe, for example, a TB was um, seen only in rural areas, um, then it was more or less gone and it now comes back in the big cities um, because it's first of all due to mobility, so people that come from other countries, but also because of the just the, the sheer size of people living close together. And then diseases like TB also have a chance to reappear. So that's um, why we think it's important to not only make better treatments, but also better diagnosis, um, because that's still not good enough. So we're not detecting every time. And you don't want to basically do invasive lung uh, biopsies or lung uh, bronchoscopies all the time. So again, there have been people that have done data um, and they had some indication. And uh, what we did basically is we took the data and um, took them at, from these different studies and then had them learn locally and then was also learned by Swarm. And you can, I think you can easily see here how much better the Swarm basically performs when you look at accuracy, sensitivity, and specificity. By the way, we, we did um, uh, random permutations in the sense of that we um, basically um, distributed the samples once they were siloed to test local tests and training um, several different times to reduce or to understand what is the impact of individual samples. Um, but even then it doesn't matter, the swarm is basically outperforming. And of course, one of the major issues is that you have more samples, uh, information from more samples available. Um, <clears throat> We can also show that um, what how it behaves to the central model, and you can see that this is on par uh, for accuracy. D was even better, and the reason was because we had some huge bias in one of the of the data sets. Um, and if that if you take that basically into the central model, that bias is not really taken care of. While you know this one data set was only at one site, and since we treated the sites equally, this huge bias was actually much more reduced than it could be reduced in a central model. Of course, you could uh, also in the central model, if you know about this bias or you, you think you know about this bias, you could actually 
um, tune the parameters for these samples, but this is something that would be much more sophisticated than it was done here in the swarm learning model. Now, the, the next thing is, uh, of course, you know, um, we started this all during the pandemic and we wanted to know one simple thing, you know, could you by just learning together, we could, because, you know, from the from nature to the WHO to to many organizations, to the European Union and so on, they all said, you know, you, we have to work together. But the reality is for many things, it was really difficult because sharing data was kind of still tricky during the pandemic. Yeah, Because the European Union, for example, said, yeah, yeah you can share data, but GDPR rules still completely uh, are in place. So do not screw with that. And that whole held it up a lot of people, particularly across nations. Yeah. And so um, that was another motivation. But then we said, like, you know, can we do something with that? And of course, you could argue, you know, a COVID patient is diagnosed by an antigen test or by a PCR for the viral RNA. That's true. Yeah. But first of all, both of them can be false positive or negative. So that, that is um, not to underestimate. And the second, it doesn't tell you anything about the disease itself. Yeah. So is this a mild cause? Is this a severe course, you know, is this something that uh, we, we need to uh, uh, check? And of course, if you measure the response of the patient to COVID, then that gives you a completely different level. Um, and so um, that's why we, we went into that. And I said, you know, what if there would be an outbreak scenario where there is a, a, a region where there's a couple of hospitals that now have a couple of cases and could we basically use blood, blood transcriptomics to identify those cases? That was the question. And of course, there's a couple of other things in transcriptomes and we have published that independently. I'm just mentioning it here. We can uh, learn a lot about the disease biology. We did this by single cell uh, sequencing and by bulk um, and published that in cell. We we have predictive biomarkers. We did that together with colleagues in Kiel, and we could even predict drug targets that might reverse what we saw in the disease um, on the transcriptome level. These are some computation models, how you basically can do drug repurposing. But here we used basically the pattern that COVID induced in the patient to see whether we can use that pattern to identify patients. Now, and so uh, we asked a lot of colleagues across Europe, from Athens, from Nijmegen in the Netherlands, from German hospitals, that they would basically spare with us their transcriptome data from from their patients. And then we had basically here in this one setting, we had six different hospitals. Now these are really hospitals. So E1 is one hospital, E2 is one, and so on. And uh, we try to make sure that they're giving us uh, almost the same numbers for the for the beginning. And you could see that there were different numbers of COVID-19 patients. So E6 and E8, actually, uh, we learned in the end had none. Yeah, so we just got controls more or less. You can also imagine that they alone cannot train COVID because they don't have cases. We also know a lot about their age ranges. You can also see there, there's an interesting note, E5. There were a lot of, from these COVID patients, there were a lot of young, yeah? So this is a children's hospital, yeah? Interesting situation. Then you see what was expected. There were more males in the COVID cases. And then there's a couple of other, uh, other aspects that we also checked. And then we basically looked at the training aspects. And you can easily see that um, when you now look at the uh, testing node, it's a different node. And we did also some completely different, so this, this would be a, another hospital, yeah? It's very simple to see whatever we measured more or less the the um, the um, um, swarm learning outperforms and of course if you take all the parameters across then for sure but what's what's worrisome is that there are some single nodes yeah if they train their local models like e3 then the e3 node and then you test it on e7 you know it's basically worse than gambling yeah so again telling you that you know, if, if you cannot integrate enough data and um, take out enough of the biases that come from individual sites, this um, is very hard in medicine with few, few um, data, whereas swarm learning really brings you already to very high numbers. You know, some of them, like the AUC, is in the range of what we can see with PCR tests, actually. Um, and I'll skip that because that only tells us that if we use that basically on the other data sets. So now this time we're basically testing all the data sets, you know, um, and see who is basically able to um, predict the patients from another center. Then again, the only one that can do it very well is the swarm itself. 
but there is not a single site that could predict all other sites equally well. And that's, I think, is, is a very strong sign to say, like, working together here using these technologies is the way forward. Now, what, what we do already is um, we basically take that forward. We build now networks where we can actually work together yeah, um, and have the, the central and privacy preserving design. Um, we know that it's outperforming the single nodes um, across all the tested uh, diseases. We're now trying to do more of that, of course. We have done a lot of different clinical scenarios. Um, we biased a lot, for example, taking notes really only from different cities or taking only different ages. Yeah, so these biases were all introduced and Swarm really holds up all the time. Um, the different technologies I showed you. Then what I didn't show you is, but we were asked to do that also with x-rays. And there we used uh, one of the largest x-rays on, on, uh, on lung. Um, which is from Kaggle, um, and here again, um, Swarm outperformed clearly. Yeah, and with that, I would like to uh, stop my presentation and we can discuss further. I have uh, a lot of people that collaborated here. It's important that the whole Hewlett Packard Enterprise team, and then a lot of clinicians that helped um, us to give samples and colleagues that helped us to understand COVID. Um, and then my group, um, um, particularly um, Steffi and, and Matthias, who basically did uh, a lot of the uh, ground uh, work that is necessary. And with that, I will think I'll stop sharing and then I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much for, for your talk. That, that was excellent and very, very exciting to, to listen to this advance in swarm, swarm learning for medical AI. Yeah, there's virtual applause coming in for your talk. Thanks a lot, network and... members. Um, sure. we, so now, please raise your hand if you would like to ask a question. To give network, so Diane is raising her hand. Please, Diane, go first. Um, to thank you very much. Um, I have to say that this field is quite new to me, so I'm sorry if I missed uh, missed the answer to my question. Um, when you jointly compute a function over multiple um, participant inputs while keeping those input private. And um, at some point you need to merge uh, models of each participant. And there are many possibilities to do, uh, to do that in a secure way, uh, such as secure multi-party computation or secure uh, enclave. And I was wondering how you, you actually mm -hmm. chose uh, the methods. So the, the important part for our, our efforts that we have done so far is that um, we never shared the, um, or we never learned together across nodes. So every node learns alone, yeah, mm -hmm. um, a local model and only shares then the parameters out of the data space that was best performing. And then you have different ways of comparing. Yeah, so the the node that is then basically chosen randomly to say like, okay, I take I take now all the information in. And what to do now with that, yeah? And for the next epoch, basically. And what we chose is basically we did um, we we did basically a very simple model. All the parameters that came in, we took the the median or the mean, and then this information was given back for again completely independent local uh, calculation um, on the on the nodes themselves. So there is never across two nodes or more than two nodes um, joined model learning. It's always local. You take the same algorithm, but it's always only local. And like this, you basically only optimize the parameter space. It has nothing to do anymore with, with the individual patients at each site. And it has nothing to do with, with, I know there's other ways you can basically learn across sites on one model, but that's not the case here. Because this, this is a, the model parameter that you merge. Exactly, but only the model parameter. But and, and then again, you use that basically as an input for your next round. But again, you go, go then lo local. You completely siloed also for the next epoch for each of the nodes. The only sign that you give as a node, you say like, uh, we decided, for example, to go for a certain time of local optimization or local uh, training and when you're done you just signal basically to the to the node that has been chosen to collect the information i'm done i will now send my parameters that um, performed best in my local setting 
to that node so that that can be integrated then on that particular node for this particular round of learning. Okay, thank you. You could use it different, but I like it because that really means that, you know, during the learning process, the training process, you never are, you are never connected with anybody else. You're really doing it only on yourself. So like this, the chance that something goes left or right to somebody else is really minimized further. Yeah, that's a very important point for medicine. Yeah, I see. Are there further questions on Zoom? So there, there is a question in the chat uh, that I'll read out, um, namely from Jada Lali. Question for Professor Schulze. What do you think is the coolest thing for further development in this area? Would you go for some AI element in the structure? That's the, the question. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, for me, the coolest thing is that we actually have now a situation that um, when I talk to medical people, that what this thing can do now and that they have basically the opportunity to work together with, with others amongst each other, peer to peer, yeah? Like, you know, not like there's somebody ruling now or there's an AI group that wants to take all the data and so on. Yeah? There, um, but you say like, no, 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 everybody in the swarm is equal. Yeah? Everybody has, you know, we agree on similar rights. Everybody is similarly important. And there's nobody ruling this whole thing except we all together, like a real swarm. Then they all open. Suddenly they all want to join. Yeah. And before, when we said, like, you know, we want to use your data for some AI, you know, the often the answer was, you know, why do you not need our data? And what is what am I getting out of this? Yeah. And why should I give you the data? So the mindset has changed completely. And that's for me the coolest thing because I know I'm a physician, you know, I can say that. I know how difficult physicians are, <laughs> yeah. But now I, you know, you approach them and and they say, of course, yeah, I want to, I want to be part of this, yeah. And I think that's something we should uh, foster quickly, and and other people, not only us, should do that and say, like, see whether they have the same impression, um, yeah. And for me, that's also a European idea. Yeah, it's really like we 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 want to have everybody who brings something in has some rights and responsibilities. And that there, there is not a, a central person, organization, country or whatever that rules us all. That's something I think in Europe we shouldn't have. Um, and uh, this is the European idea. So that's for me another cool thing. And that can be beyond yeah. medicine. I have one comment uh, or comment slash question. <laughs> so I'm coordinating the harmonization of the uh, intensive care unit data all over Switzerland between all Swiss university hospitals. And we face two big challenges in that. The first one is actually solved by your work. So we, there were years of negotiations regarding data transfer agreements, legal legal yeah. uh, permits to, to exchange the data between the, the hospitals or to, to bring them to a central site. So this is solved by your work and I admire your work for that. The second point is, even when we have brought the data to a central site, and even if we have all the legal stuff sorted out, the data is, even if it were coded, uh, encoded according to the same code book, still not fully consistent. So we still yeah. have a major effort of data harmonization to do. Still, the data is still not fully interoperable uh, when yeah. it reaches the central site. So my question to you is, how do you prevent this from affecting like the quality of your decentralized model, that there are inconsistencies at the single nodes yeah. Uh, that you cannot um, like detect or that may, yeah. maybe you have a way to detect it, but how do you de detect inconsistencies at local nodes in the yeah. swarm? Yeah. So Carsten, this is, this is a very, very important question. And um, because the, I, I, I take the question the, a little bit the opposite around and say like, where would I start in medicine? And, and, and people ask me, why did you use transcriptomes? That's not yet in the clinic. Can't you use something that is that there's thousands of data out there? And I said, the reason why we use transcriptomes, it's, it's highly standardized compared to many things that are happening. So for the first showing pilot and show proof of principle, we needed that. Now comes the groundwork, you know, the one that you're ex the experiencing. What is the, what is the next data space where we can actually use what they're doing in the clinic? Because honestly, it's a zoo. Yeah, medicine is a zoo. <laughs> there is, and so many flavors of, of what you think is the same, you know, there's two giraffes and then it's like, you know, just put them together and it's like, no, it's like two different animals. Yeah. 
And, and um, yeah, I think we have to train our people. We are discussing right now with the, the, the neuroimaging people because they have some very specific questions and they have systems where the standardization is very high. So the, we're actually going the other way around. So like, where is the next data space that is useful and meaningful across sites usable? Okay. So um, I'm admiring now what you're doing because I, although it's super important, the ICU, um, every ICU is a little bit different. Yeah, of course. And, 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 the, and it's very much people driven. You know, if you have very good people on the ICU, it's different than if not and so on. And I'm pretty sure the data shows that. Yeah. So um, to your last question, if I have that situation and what to do is, you know, make, start with, with very few data with very and see what the bias is you know to learn about the bias so we this is the example we did with the transcriptome where i said like we used microarray and rna sec where we know from you know because we're handling that for 10 years for 20 years now we know what the differences are from a biological perspective even now yeah? and so we we quickly could see whether the swarm can deal with that or not because we we looked at that without machine learning we just looked at technical technical level and yeah. so like this is the difference that we know. Yeah, Gene X in this technology has five value and in this has seven. And this one has two and this one has 10. Yeah, And so we knew exactly for each of the parameters, what do we expect based on the technical bias? And then saw afterwards, does this have an impact still or not? Yeah. So you have to dissect the data and say like, okay, I have to start to learn and understand what the values mean. And, and, and then really, you know, do simple stats on comparison of two sites and say, okay, now I see what, what, how they differ and then see what that impact is on the machine learning. Thank you very much. So it was a very inspiring talk and a very fruitful discussion here. And now also thank you for, um, for taking the time to meet the doctoral students of our network. This will happen in a breakout room now in the next um, minute. So you will... Uh, so, so Katarina will open this breakout room. We send another round of applause to you for this talk. It was really enjoyable. On behalf of the other PIs in the network and the general audience, I say goodbye now and thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. And we'll continue with the general program here at uh, 3 p.m. Central European time with a talk by uh, Peter Klaes. <laughs>